from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, which is the reading promotion arm of the library. And we have many ways of promoting books and reading. Around the country, we have affiliated state centers for the book that work with us largely in promoting authors and book festivals uh, in their own states. Uh, we also are a, uh, play a major role in the National Book Festival here, which is sponsored by the Library of Congress. And our next festival is uh, on the books for uh, September 25th. And we'll be uh, announcing many of the authors next week. And I hope that those of you who are local will uh, mark that date. Uh, here in the Library of Congress, one of our favorite ways of promoting books is by promoting new books that have been published and that have a special connection to the Library of Congress, either through the collections of the Library of Congress or sometimes through special projects that uh, have been developed. And our Books and Beyond series, which we call it, uh, has now been responsible for something like 230 noontime book talks since about in the last decade or so. And all of these talks by authors of their new books uh, are videotaped for later presentation on the library's website. So we are keeping a record of these talks as well as the talks from the National Book Festival. So all in all, we're developing uh, quite a, a website presence for a, which presents a snapshot really of largely American, but not entirely uh, American, contemporary American literature. Uh, because our talks are all videotaped, uh, we do ask that people turn off things electronic. Uh, our sequence will be a presentation by um, our guest author uh, with a brief presentation, then a time for questions and answers, and then a book signing starting about 1 o'clock here in this room. And the books are here and available at a slight Library of Congress discount. Uh, we hope you participate in the question and answer part of this. Uh, but if you do, of course, you are giving us permission to use both your ideas and your, your presence uh, in our webcast if, in fact, uh, you make the cut. And that's something that always sometimes happens and sometimes doesn't. Uh, we do have a schedule of uh, forthcoming Library of Congress uh, events, Center for the Book events, really, and talks over on the table where the books are being sold. And we also have an explanation of a new, a popular new feature, which is the Books and Beyond Facebook Book Club. And so you can, on Facebook now, not only learn about forthcoming talks, but enter into discussions about some of the talks that we've had. And it's a whole other way for us to both publicize our talks uh, and to uh, look ahead with discussions of important issues that are, after all, reflected perhaps best of all in books, not entirely, but certainly in subjects such as biography and some of the historical subjects. Uh, the books are important, and we are happy to be in the position of, of not only promoting them, but uh, making certain that people remember the power of books and reading uh, in our lives. Uh, to present uh, to our speaker, uh, one Jeff I'm presenting I'm another Jeff, Jeff Flannery, who is the head of the library's manuscript reading room, and he is the very Jeff Flannery whom our author, Jeff Sheschel, generously thanks in this book. Jeff Flannery. Let's give Jeff a hand. Thank you, John. And thanks also to your superb staff for arranging the Books and Beyond series, which is a significant forum for uh, the display of authors' works. The Manuscript Division is custodian of more than 60 million unpublished documents relating to American history and culture. The division holds the personal papers of prominent historical figures and the records of non-governmental agencies. Notable examples include the papers of George Washington, 
Frederick Douglass, Margaret Mead, and the records of the NAACP. These varied collections of diaries, correspondence, and other archival items supply the primary sources for the writing of history and include some of the nation's most treasured documents, Thomas Jefferson's rough draft of the Declaration of Independence, two copies of the Gettysburg Address in Abraham Lincoln's handwriting, James Madison's notes on the debates in the Federal Convention of 1787, and Alexander Graham Bell's first drawing of the telephone. Researchers travel from every state of the Union and overseas to consult the wealth of materials found in these incomparable collections. Working closely with patrons every day in the manuscript reading room, the division staff is gratified to see when a scholar's efforts appear in print, and especially so when a book is critically recognized as making a contribution to the general historical discourse. One such scholar is today's speaker, Jeff Seschel. Jeff is the founding partner of West Wing Writers, a speech writing and strategic communications firm based in Washington, D.C. Before this, he served as deputy speech writer for, Bill, for President Bill Clinton. Jeff's public service career is complemented by his scholarly pursuits. He holds degrees in history from Oxford and Brown Universities, served as distinguished fellow in American studies at Princeton University, and is a Rhodes Scholar. His first endeavor in political history, Mutual Contempt, Lyndon Johnson, Robert Kennedy, and the Feud That Defined a Decade, is a remarkable and well-received account of two dominant politicians struggling for power during the tumultuous decade of the 1960s. Jeff's second foray into political history is the subject of today's talk, Supreme Power, Franklin Roosevelt versus the Supreme Court. In this thoroughly researched and absorbing tale, Jeff guides the reader through an epic clash between all three branches of the federal government during one of the great, greatest crises to face the nation, the Great Depression. Supreme Power has received critical acclaim from several reviewers who agree that Jeff's account provides fresh insight into the motivations and of the shapers of this chapter in America's past, a chapter that continues to resonate as we see in today's headlines about nominations and appointments to the Supreme Court. Please welcome Jeff Session. Thanks, Jeff, and uh, I want to thank all of you for uh, coming on a, uh, at, at lunchtime on a beautiful day on a Friday, um, and I will try not to detain you too terribly long, especially since this will apparently be archived forever in the spirit of this building. I will try not to say anything that I might regret 30 or 40 years from now. Um, first, I want to thank John Cole, and I, I want to thank the Center for the Book for having me here today. Uh, this uh, is a terrific program to be a part of, and uh, this space for me feels something like a homecoming, uh, thanks especially to Jeff Flannery here, and uh, I'm continually grateful. Uh, with every review that is kind enough to mention the research uh, that went into this book, uh, I owe yet another debt of gratitude to Jeff and to the whole team in the manuscript reading room. Uh, it's a very collaborative environment down there. As some of you may know, it, it really isn't just a space where you show up with a list of things that you want and pull uh, boxes and files from the shelf. It's really a conversation. And uh, so much of what went into this book uh, was generated not by my own dogged research, but by suggestions from Jeff in particular and others on his team down there. Uh, I remember a conversation that Jeff and I had really just in, in passing one day where uh, he said, have you ever heard of Admiral Hobson? And I said, never, never heard of the guy. I'd been working on this book for years. And he said, well, he's an interesting guy. Why don't you take a look at some of his files? I'll call up some boxes for you. And it just opened up a whole world for me about the groups, the grassroots organizations on the right uh, that agitated, as, as we'll talk about in a moment, uh, agitated against Roosevelt's court packing plan. None of that would be there in this book if not for that passing suggestion. Uh, by Jeff. So I'm, I'm deeply grateful um, continually uh, as I go forward and talk about the book to, to groups like this. Um, I just want to begin by uh, talking a little bit about a reversal of fortune. Uh, Roosevelt's reversal of fortune, we tend to look back at the Roosevelt administration as one of uh, really remarkable success, enduring success after success. Uh, beginning with his efforts against the Great Depression uh, during the New Deal, and then, of course, uh, the great triumph of World War II. But uh, think for a moment about 
this contrast. In 1936, in November 1936, as many of you know, Roosevelt was elected by one of the biggest landslides in American history. Uh, it was not simply a landslide for Roosevelt, but for the Democratic Party generally. And the new Congress that uh, began in January of 1937 uh, was so dominated by Democrats that we were closer to one party rule than America had been since Reconstruction. And the Senate at that time had 96 members, 96 for 48 states, of course. Out of those 96 senators, 76 were Democrats and not even all of the remaining 20 were Republicans. And so in February of 1937, when Roosevelt launched his plan to pack the Supreme Court, he seemed almost certain to prevail. In fact, just about everybody, including Roosevelt himself, was sure that, that he would get exactly what he wanted. And one member of the Senate said, well, look, if the President asked Congress to commit suicide tomorrow, we'd do it. <laughs> Six months later, Roosevelt had suffered the most spectacular defeat of his political life. The New Deal was stalled. Congress, his own party in Congress and in the country was divided. Uh, his popularity had suffered the steepest decline of his presidency. And he had helped to create, by introducing this court packing bill, a new conservative coalition in the Congress, a coalition of conservative Democrats, mostly from the South, and the few remaining Republicans who would confront him increasingly and block the New Deal for essentially the remainder of his presidency. Uh, the Saturday Evening Post at that time judged that, in their words, he commands support, but not the old awe, reverence, or idolatry. So what happened? That really is the story uh, uh, that I try to tell in Supreme Power. How did this incredible reversal of fortune come about, and what were the consequences? It is, of course, mostly the product of the court packing plan and the mistakes Roosevelt made along the way. But I found, as I began my research, that the court fight is one of those events in American history that is often referenced. It comes up in all kinds of accounts and even in the popular press today, references to Roosevelt's ill-fated court packing plan. It's one of those things that's often mentioned, but it's never really very well explained. If it's explained at all, it tends to get reduced to a, a neat, pat parable of presidential overreach. This is what presidents do in their second terms in office when they're overcome uh, uh, by a, a feeling of uh, too much power, um, that it's simply hubris. And it's left at that. So what this creates then is a sense that there are really these two Roosevelts, that there's this Roosevelt of the 100 days uh, the Roosevelt who dispelled fear itself simply by giving that magnificent speech in March 1933, the Roosevelt that we all know and that many of us love. Then there's the Roosevelt of the court fight, who seems to be arrogant, hubristic, and, clout and, and, and uh, 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 clouded in his judgments. And then after the court fight, the clouds clear, and he goes back to being the Roosevelt that we all know and many of us love, the Roosevelt who leads us to victory in World War II. This never really washed for me. It never really seemed to me that there could be two different Franklin Roosevelts. And so I got into this really to answer a question for myself. Can you reconcile the Roosevelt that we think that we know and then the Roosevelt in this weird apparent aberration of the court fight? I really wanted to understand whether it really was just a matter of hubris. Was it simply that he was flush with the victory of 1936 and overcome by feelings of vindictiveness toward the court? Or was it more to it than that? Certainly there had to be an element of all that, but was that all there was to it or was there more? Uh, that was one question that, that led me to decide to write this book. There were a couple of others concerning the other two branches of government. With respect to the Supreme Court, which switched in the famous switch in time that saved nine, the court that had been striking down the New Deal, as I'll describe, suddenly began upholding the New Deal in the middle of the court packing fight. Was it really simply giving in to political pressure, or was there something else going on? This, too, I wanted to understand. And finally, what led the Congress, which had given Roosevelt essentially everything he had asked for of any significance during his first term, what led this Congress that came in on his coattails to defy him on the first thing he asked them to do? in his second term. 
So I came to see the court fight as essential to understanding Roosevelt, his presidency, and, and really his times. This was the defining conflict, this conflict between Roosevelt and the Supreme Court and Roosevelt and his conservative critics. It was the defining conflict of his presidency in the years before World War II. And the stakes, as both sides saw it, were nothing less than the survival of democracy. Roosevelt and his supporters really felt that if they couldn't find a way to pass social and economic reforms, if they couldn't find a way to pull the country out of the Depression, that there would be a total social and economic collapse in the country, there would be violence, and there would be dictatorship in the way that you saw in Europe. This was a very real fear for many people in this country, including Roosevelt himself. On the other side, on the right, there was a very strong belief that if Roosevelt was able to centralize power in Washington to the extent that he was seeking to do, and if he was able to pass these experiments in the form of the New Deal, that it would extinguish many of the principles on which this country was founded. It would erode, the pro it would erode property rights. It would extinguish individual liberty. We would be living, in their view, in a socialist, collectivist, regimented society, and democracy would be extinguished. So both sides saw the stakes in similar apocalyptic terms. And really, in this moment, America is poised in the middle of a fundamental argument. Two different notions of the Constitution and what it enables government to do. And this argument seemed in 1937 to be resolved. But as we see today, this argument is never really resolved. And that's why I, f I felt, uh, again, as I got deeper into this, that this not only helps us to understand most directly Roosevelt and his times, but even tells us something about our own times. Uh, history doesn't always repeat itself, but sometimes it does echo itself, sometimes more loudly than others. And I think we've seen in recent months with President Obama's shot across the bow at the Supreme Court in the State of the Union address, the response from Justice Alito, the response later from Chief Justice Roberts, the suit by the Attorney General uh, against the health care bill, uh, the, uh, the controversy uh, over uh, the Kagan nomination, as uh, we are seeing right now, all reveals the extent to which this argument is always unsettled. This argument over the meaning of the Constitution, over the limits of governmental power, and whether democracy, as Roosevelt put it, can be made to work in times of economic distress. This is a long simmering argument in American history. It goes all the way back to our founding, and it becomes explosive in times of economic distress. That's what happened in the 1930s, and that may well be what's happening today. Let me tell you a little bit about the antagonists in this conflict. Uh, first, of course, Franklin Roosevelt. I'm sure I don't need to tell you much about Roosevelt. Um, so I'll focus on something that not as many people know about, uh, which is Roosevelt as a lawyer. Not everybody knows that Roosevelt was a lawyer. It's not something he made very much of, because Roosevelt did not think very much of lawyers uh, or of the practice of law. Uh, he had gone like a, a respectable member of the uh, American aristocracy. He had gone to law school after finishing at Harvard. He went to Columbia. He didn't do terribly well there. He had to repeat a couple courses in the summer that he had failed. He passed them easily when he repeated them. Uh, it was not a lack of intellect. It was a lack of interest. And he ultimately took the bar and never finished his degree at Columbia, which was a pretty common thing in those days, um, le much less common today. Uh, he just never saw any purpose in going back to school. He didn't enjoy learning about the law. And many, many years later, he was at, uh, when he was president, actually, he was at a dinner with Nicholas Mur Murray Butler, who was the president of Columbia University. And Butler sort of joked with him a little bit about the fact that he had never completed his law degree at Columbia and that maybe he ought to come back and finish. And Roosevelt, in his characteristic way, threw his head back and laughed and said, that just shows how unimportant the law really is. <laughs> Robert Jackson, who became uh, Roosevelt's attorney general and ultimately one of his appointees to the Supreme Court, observed later that Roosevelt, in his words, didn't really like the judicial process with its slow movement. He wanted shortcuts. He wanted to move things quickly. But to be clear, this did not mean that Roosevelt was uninterested in law or unconcerned with the Constitution. He thought a lot about the Constitution. He had a fairly well-developed constitutional philosophy. And he had all sorts of precedent that he could cite. 
uh, to, uh, to, to support his view. He was a believer in a living constitution, which was a notion really of uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes as it had been around since the late 19th century, this idea of a living or organic constitution that had to evolve uh, with respect to modern realities. And Roosevelt really believed in his words that the Constitution was marvelously elastic. That's a very Rooseveltian phrase. It was marvelously elastic. And again, this doesn't mean that he thought it was simply pliable and could be stretched in any direction. But he believed very strongly that the founders, in their wisdom, had designed a very flexible, uh, a very flexible Constitution that would allow government to work, that would allow democracy to succeed, no matter what sort of challenges were presented. And so, in the 1930s, in the early 1930s, there was a feeling in some quarters on the left that the, that the Constitution had become obsolete. There was a best-selling book published right at the time of Roosevelt's inauguration called Our Obsolete Constitution, <laughs> and putting it very plainly. And a lot of liberals and progressives felt that the Constitution was designed for different times, for an agricultural era, and it really wasn't well suited to the industrial era, and it needed to be amended in a serious way. Or perhaps we needed to call another constitutional convention and just start over again. Roosevelt didn't believe this at all. Uh, he thought, he'd like to quote a previous Chief Justice, um, Chief Justice White, who said that the Constitution was a broad highway through which pro progress could be enjoyed. And Roosevelt really did believe that the Constitution empowered not just government generally, but the federal government to do most of what it needed to do uh, to solve fundamental social and economic problems. Now, this was in contrast to a well-established view on the right, which uh, held that the Constitution was really a document of limitations. Of course, we can all see and agree that both of these things are, are true at the same time, but it's a question of emphasis, fundamentally. And the conservative justices on the court and most of the legal profession believe that the Constitution was a document of limitations that imposed strict limits on governmental power and basically forbade the government from doing most of the things that Roosevelt and progressives wanted the government to do. They believed in, uh, uh, they also had very different views of what the judge's role would be. Roosevelt felt the judges ultimately needed to interpret the Constitution and needed to advance our understanding of it in light of current events. The conservative justices on the court, and again their supporters, believe that the meaning of the Constitution was fixed at the time of the nation's founding, that it was generally pretty clear in most, if not all, cases, and that really, as one of the justices put it in an opinion in 1936, the judge's job was simply to take the statute that had been challenged in court, the law that had been challenged in court, take the Constitution, the relevant provision in the Constitution that had been challenged, line them up, see if they matched, and if they did, then it was constitutional, and if they didn't, it was unconstitutional. It was pretty simple business. Law was described as a science. Um, not everybody bought this. Roscoe Pound of Harvard Law School said that this lining up of statute and provision was, was what he called the slot machine theory of jurisprudence. And uh, we have other metaphors for it today. Um, our current Chief Justice, famously during his confirmation hearings, describe the judge's role as, a, as an umpire. We simply call balls and strikes. There's a strike zone. If it's outside the strike zone, it's a ball. And if it's in the strike zone, it's a strike. It's pretty simple business, judging. Uh, again, Roosevelt didn't buy that. And so there was a clash that was coming, and everybody saw it. Let me describe briefly the Supreme Court that Roosevelt was up against when he took office in March 1933. It was the oldest court in American history. A few years later, in 1936, at the moment, the peak of the conflict, the average age of the justices was 71. And it was not simply their age that was at issue, because the oldest of these justices was the great liberal Brandeis. He was the oldest man on the court. It was their orientation. Some of these justices, the conservative justices, were really 19th century men. Here we were in the industrial era, in the middle of the Great Depression, and you had justices on the court who, in the case of Willis Van Devanter, whose papers are, are here in this building, or maybe off-site, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, Van Devanter uh, was old enough to have remembered watching Lincoln's funeral procession when he was a boy. Justice Sutherland, another of the conservatives, had been born in England before either Gladstone or Disraeli had been prime minister. 
and Charles Evans Hughes, the Chief Justice in the 1930s. Hughes, when he was a student at my alma mater, Brown University, had two closets in his room. One was for his stuff, and the other was for coal which he would then shovel into his heater. And of course, they had no central lighting or, or, or central plumbing in his dorm in those days. We did a little better in the 1980s and 90s. And so you had a court that was, that had been, that was not only old or oriented to the 19th century, but as Roosevelt and just about everybody saw it, had been a powerfully conservative force in American life for at least a half century, really beginning in earnest in the 1880s and the 1890s. Uh, the court had aligned, him, aligned itself very aggressively against social reform and economic reform movement, movements of every kind. It had uh, overturned the income tax in 1895, uh, notoriously in the Lochner case in 1905. It forbade the state of New York from regulating working hours and conditions. In 1918, in the Hammer case, the court overturned a federal ban on child labor and said that the Constitution um, says nothing about such things and it's not within the power of the federal government to do anything about child labor. And so the court had been very powerfully conservative and it really was a court without a center. On the left, you had the great liberal justices, Brandeis, who I mentioned, Cardozo, and Harlan Fisk Stone, who's an interesting case because he had been Coolidge's attorney general, he was a Republican, he was a close friend of Herbert Hoover's, but he believed in judicial restraint. And he believed that Roosevelt and the Congress were entitled to make just about any mistake that they wanted to make on social policy. It wasn't the court's business to police matters of economic policy. That aligned him with the liberals. On the right, you had a group that was known and is still known as the Four Horsemen, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And the spirit of the Four Horsemen was really captured by James McReynolds, who ironically was a Democratic appointee, had been appointed by Hoover. I'm sorry, by, by Wilson. He had been Wilson's attorney general and so disliked by Wilson that the, the, the talk was that, that Wilson had um, kicked him upstairs to get rid of him to get him out of the cabinet and always regretted it. And he was probably the most disliked man ever to serve on, on the Supreme Court, disliked by his fellow justices and just about anybody who ran into him. He was a vicious anti-Semite and uh, refused to sit next to either Brandeis or Cardozo in the court's <laughs> annual photos. Uh, and uh, when the nomination of Cardozo uh, was a live possibility before the nomination had come, he went to Hoover, McReynolds did, and said, please do not, in his words, afflict the court with another Jew. And when Hoover nominated Cardozo, McReynolds, to make clear his feeling about this, sat through the induction ceremony reading a newspaper and rattling it very loudly in front of his face. So he was sort of the id of the conservatives uh, on the court at the time. And in the middle, you had two justices, Hughes, who had been something of a liberal during his first time on the court between 1910 and 1916, um, but had been working for Republican presidents and for corporate interests ever since, and seemed now to be aligning himself with the conservatives. And then Owen Roberts, whose philosophy was unclear even to his fellow justices but seemed increasingly, as the New Deal got going, to be aligning himself with the conservatives and very fiercely in reaction uh, to what Roosevelt was doing. So here was a court that was divided not only over socioeconomic questions, but also over the court's role in a democracy and whether the court had any business judging whether economic policies were wise or unwise. So Roosevelt when he took office in 1933, saw a clash coming. Everybody did on both sides of it. He hoped that his programs would be passed quickly, as many of them were, and that they would become so entrenched in American life so quickly that the court, no matter what it thought, would have to think twice before overturning any of these things, that they would be so popular and so important to the economic life of the nation. Uh, turned out he was wrong about that. He was right that a clash was coming. He was wrong uh, that the court would uh, be willing to accept these programs. And beginning in the court fight, as it was known at the time, uh, began in earnest in January 1935 when the court overturned a piece of the NRA, which was the National Recovery Administration, really the centerpiece of the New Deal. Uh, the court had begun, in the words of one conservative newspaper, to, quote, throw this revolutionary nonsense into the Potomac where it belongs. And they did so 
uh, with great gusto beginning uh, at the start of 1935, and in short order had overturned the entirety of the NRA, had overturned the AAA, the agricultural program, uh, overturned a coal act, overturned a state minimum wage, and everybody thought, again, on both sides, not just left but right, everybody thought Social Security was next. The National Labor Relations Act, the Wagner Act as it was known, uh, was also uh, on, uh, in the court sites, and that there was simply nothing that Roosevelt could do of any significance that would be able to pass muster with the conservative majority on this court. And it was not just the Supreme Court, but it was the entire federal judiciary. Roosevelt, on his way into office, asked his incoming Attorney General, Homer Cummings, to do a quick survey to see how many Republicans there were on the federal bench at all levels, district court, circuit court, and up to the Supreme Court, and how many Democrats. And because of the many years of Republican rule, there were only 28% uh, only, uh, of the appointees on the federal bench were Democratic appointees. This did not make all of them liberal, as James McReynolds made clear. Uh, and not all the Republicans were conservative. But that does, go, does give you a sense of how fully the deck was stacked against the New Deal on the federal courts. And indeed, in 1935, district courts issued more than 1,600 injunctions halting enforcement of New Deal laws, which is something that the district courts were able to do in those days. And so they were shutting down the New Deal at the local level long before these cases even got to the Supreme Court. And so it was not just the fact of these decisions that were overturning the New Deal, um, but it was the tone of, the, of these decisions. Again, I talked about the apocalyptic sense on both sides that democracy was in danger. And uh, the, the Chicago Daily Tribune, one of the most conservative papers in America in those days, uh, really captured uh, the tone. It, it talked of New Deal programs as Hitlerism. And this seems ludicrous to us right now, but of course these were the years of the rise of Adolf Hitler. These were the years of Mussolini. And both sides, as I mentioned before, were looking across the water to European dictatorships and seeing that danger here, whether that danger in the view of conservatives came from Roosevelt or on the, in the view of, of the left and, and labor and so forth, whether that danger um, was one that would come if Roosevelt failed. And McReynolds, as I mentioned before, really was the one who captured the, the spirit of this court, even if he wasn't the intellectual driver of its decisions. Um, he said during one case that went 5-4 in favor of Roosevelt's monetary policy, uh, he said in an extemporaneous dissent delivered from the bench, he said, the Constitution is gone. This is Nero at his worst. And so as bad as things are today, uh, between the conservatives and the liberals on this court. It is actually still hard to imagine even Justice Scalia saying something like that <laughs> from the bench. The intellectual architect of these conservative decisions was George Sutherland, who I mentioned earlier. And Sutherland, in, opin in an opinion at, at that time, made clear his nostalgia for a time when, in his words, indiscretion or imprudence was not to be relieved by legislation, but only through painful effort. And so this, again, was a worldview that was sharply at odds uh, with Roosevelt and indeed much of the country. And by the end of the term, uh, the one that ended in June 1936, one uh, columnist, a syndicated columnist, likened the scene in Washington to the end of a Shakespeare tragedy. At the end of the, the play, the, the, the stage is strewn with dead bodies. And those dead bodies were New Deal programs. Uh, Roosevelt himself said that what the court had done during this incredible uh, run of about 17 months was to create a no man's land in which neither states or the federal government could govern. And so during this time, it's probably not a surprise that the Roosevelt administration was weighing very seriously what on earth to do about the court, not simply to fight and usually lose these battles one by one, but to do something more fundamental about the court and about judicial power. And this was not simply happening within the halls of the Department of Justice or the White House, but this was actually, in very many ways, in a significant way, a national conversation. The country in 1935, 1936, as it saw one headline after another, one major program overturned after another, the country became something like a constitutional convention, a rolling constitutional convention in which everybody had their pet idea about what ought to be done about the court or about the Constitution. And 
most observers who felt that something needed to be done thought, that, as I said before, that the Constitution needed to be amended, that maybe we needed to create term limits for justices. That would require a constitutional amendment. Maybe we needed to create an age limit for justices. That might get some of them off the court. Maybe we needed to empower Congress a little more rather than simply strip powers away from the court. Maybe we needed to allow Congress, by a two-thirds vote, to overturn any decision of the Supreme Court. This was a very popular alternative in the country. It had a lot of momentum in 35, 36. Uh, and Roosevelt could very well have thrown his weight behind it. That would have really unbalanced the, 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 the balance of, of federal powers uh, as envisioned by the Constitution. It would have made Congress and not the court the final word on the Constitution. There were a lot of these very radical proposals that had a lot of momentum in this country. And Roosevelt and his administration considered them all very seriously. Extensive memos I found in the files right here in this building, 65-page memos produced by lawyers in the Department of Justice analyzing one after another these constitutional amendments, what the history of this idea had been, what the possible implications of an amendment like this would be, and so forth. And one after another, Roosevelt rejected all of these ideas, partly because he felt that none of them were practical. It's very hard to pass a constitutional amendment, as we all know. But also because ultimately, drawing on something I said earlier, Roosevelt didn't think there was anything wrong with the Constitution. He disagreed with those on the left who said that the Constitution simply didn't provide for enough federal power. He believed that the problem was this court, not the Constitution. And he was not eager to mess with the fabric of the Constitution. He was eager to do something about, as they were known, the nine old men on the Supreme Court. He also rejected as he rejected amendments, he rejected the idea of waiting any longer. You would think, one would think, and people did at the time, that if this is the oldest Supreme Court in history, that eventually somebody is, by one means or another, not going to be sitting up there um, uh, much longer. And indeed, uh, uh, one of uh, the Democratic senators on Roosevelt's side said to him in 1936, Father Time is on your side. Um, but there was another quote that was bounced around Washington at that time, and it came from Justice McReynolds, who said, quote, and I will edit this uh, for the sake of uh, to elk ears on the internet, uh, I'll never resign so long as that crippled SOB is still in the White House. So Roosevelt really believes that these guys would stay on to spite him, and also because they felt that the survival of democracy depended on their staying on the court and that there was a very real danger as 36 slid into 1937 that there could be violent disorder in the country. There was a wave of sit-down strikes sweeping the nation, getting increasingly violent in early 1937. And when the Wagner Act came before the court, the National Labor Relations Act, one commentator said that the Supreme Court would write the decision in blood or ink, and it was up to the court which one. These were the stakes as Roosevelt saw it. So he did not believe that he could wait much longer. And so by the beginning of 1937, he came around to an idea that had been in the air for a long time, but had never been taken seriously, really by anyone, and that was packing the court. So a brief word about packing the court. A lot of people then, and indeed I think a lot of people today, believe that the number nine exists somewhere in the Constitution. Uh, in fact, the founders, uh, either in their wisdom or their lack thereof, did not specify the number of justices that would sit on the court. And that number went up and down over the course of the 19th century. It had been as low as five, and it had been as, as high as ten uh, at one point. And it often changed for political reasons. Uh, one seat was added to add a justice who would support Lincoln's war policies. And uh, not long after, in 1866, when a justice announced his impending retirement, Congress immediately eliminated that seat and eliminated another one pending the next retirement, just so Andrew Johnson would not get a chance to appoint anybody. So it had gone up and down, but it settled at 9 in 1869. And so by 1937, it really had the feel of permanence. Even though it was perfectly constitutional to change the number of justices on the court, nobody really thought that it was. They had to go back and they had to look at the at, at Article Three of the Constitution to see whether this was really actually okay. Um, but Roosevelt came and, his, and his Attorney General Homer Cummings came up with a device that they thought could make this saleable to the country. Um, rather than wage an ideological assault against the court, they would suggest that these old men, you know, 
they were old and they were getting slower and they were having a hard time keeping up on their work and they needed as, as Roosevelt put it new blood they needed an infusion of new blood as he said many times in the court to help these justices with their work and so the device was that for any justice over 70 who refused to retire the president would be able to appoint somebody else to come sit by his side essentially and help him with his work <laughs> up to a limit of 15 and so this, if you do the math, would allow Roosevelt, if, assuming nobody re retired, Roosevelt overnight would be able to appoint six new justices. And if he couldn't drive the conservatives off the court, he could outnumber them. And this is how he would do it. He launched the plan on February 5th, 1937. And as Sam Rosenman, his speechwriter, put it, it started with a black eye. And the black eye was this phony rationale that it was about efficiency. It was very easy to disprove, and within 24 hours, it had been thoroughly debunked on the front pages of the Washington Post with a little help from the Chief Justice, Charles Evans Hughes, who summoned the lead political reporter for the Post, then a conservative paper, summoned him into his chambers, and provided him all kinds of information very quietly to show that the, definitively that the court was not at all behind on its work. This ran on the front page, and uh, there was a series of these articles, a devastating blow to Roosevelt. And many of his advisors who had urged him to be straight with the American public about why this needed to happen, since everybody understood what was going on anyway. I mean, this had been a very public battle for years. Uh, it took them a month to finally convince him to make a straight argument about this. Uh, and meanwhile, he'd been losing the battle. Uh, really from, from the first moments. Um, the New Yorker magazine described uh, the press reaction uh, to the court plan. It said, uh, in the New Yorker's words, that one right-wing New York paper, quote, just took off all its clothes and stood screaming in the middle of the marketplace. There was hysteria in the conservative papers, and most of the papers in America were conservative. By many estimates, they had been 80 percent against Roosevelt in 1936, and even some of his liberal papers, the liberal papers were against Roosevelt on the court packing fight. And conservative Democrats who had never much liked the New Deal but had supported it all along either out of party loyalty or out of political fear and also out of concern about the Depression, it must be said, uh, began to align themselves with the Republicans in Congress as I described before and vowed to defeat this court fight. They got a lot of help over the next six months. And Roosevelt suffered one blow after another that brought down this court plan. Uh, Charles Evans Hughes, as I mentioned, was very active um, uh, in, in the opposition uh, to, to the court plan and actually considered testifying in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee against the plan, which is a really remarkable thing when you think about it, a chief justice inserting himself in the biggest political controversy in the country. And ultimately, Brandeis convinced him not to do it. Uh, that it would bring discredit upon the court. But Brandeis, who, despite his support for Roosevelt generally, was violently opposed to this plan, as all the justices were, Brandeis and Hughes cooked up a different idea, which was that they would go to the leader of the Senate opposition, a Democrat named Burt Wheeler, and they would ask Wheeler if he might be interested in their views uh, about, the again, the efficiency of the court. Wheeler, this was like a gift from God. <laughs> Indeed, many people remarked that Hughes looked a lot like God <laughs> with his great white beard. He was often compared to, to God Almighty. And so here was this great gift, and Wheeler said, why, what a wonderful idea. I'll ask you formally. Would you like to submit a letter sharing your views with the country? And Hughes said, what a wonderful idea. <laughs> so he spent the weekend writing it, and uh, he summoned Wheeler to his house on a Sunday and said, the baby is born, and handed him the letter, which Wheeler then read uh, before the country in the, in the Senate uh, uh, the, the following day, and it had a devastating effect, again, on the plan. Uh, even though the efficiency argument had really been taken down, to do it in this public way uh, had, a, had, a, had a, a terrible effect um, on, on Roosevelt's plan. And then, ultimately, and more significantly still, there was the switch in time that saved nine two decisions, one in March, one a couple of weeks later in April 1937, upholding New Deal programs. The first was actually upholding a minimum wage statute, which was not technically a New Deal program, but obviously in line with the New Deal. It was a statute that was 
essentially identical to a minimum wage law that the court had struck down less than a year before. The justice who switched was Owen Roberts. Then, as I said, in April 1937, the court, in sweeping decisions, although 5-4, upholds the Wagner Act and labor's right to bargain collectively and the ability to regulate working conditions and so forth. Again, the justice who aligned himself with the liberals, Owen Roberts. What happened? And this is an ongoing debate, and I don't pretend that I can get in the mind of Owen Roberts, who sadly does not have papers here because he burned them all before he died. And so the mind of Owen Roberts remains opaque to all of us. But I think by collecting as much information as you can about Roberts, what others saw in Roberts, and, and what's written in his decisions, and so forth, you get a picture of Roberts as a man who cared very deeply about what others thought of him not just others on the court, but others in the country. He had been talked about by Republicans as a presidential po po possibility in 1935 and 1936. He was very much a man about town in Washington. And he, more than anyone, had really taken a beating for the court's rightward turn, in the same way that when the left is agitated today about a decision by the court, most of that anger focuses on Justice Kennedy because there's some hope on the left that maybe Kennedy will be with us. Certainly Scalia and Thomas are not going to be with us, but maybe Kennedy will be with us, and then he betrays us again. And so uh, in that, that same sense, um, most of the ire was directed not at McReynolds, but it was directed at, at, at Roberts. And so it was a very tough time for him, and it does seem pretty clear when you look at his decisions over a sweep of time that he's generally a conservative justice. Then in this moment, he becomes a liberal justice, and then after this whole fight is over, he goes back essentially to being a conservative justice again. Uh, also, one of the conservative justices, a couple of weeks after that Wagner Act decision, Justice Van Devanter announces his retirement. It was very carefully timed and worked out with Burt Wheeler, who I mentioned before, to deliver maximum effect. Um, and this, too, dealt a serious blow to the court packing plan because even many of Roosevelt's own supporters said, why do we need to pack the court? We're about to get to a point of liberal, and we're going to shift the balance. Roosevelt kept fighting because what had, be what had been a battle between Roosevelt and the court was now a battle between Roosevelt and his own Congress. And he said to his advisors at the time, and he turned out to be right about this, that if the, if the Senate can defy me on this court packing bill, they will defy me on all manner of things. All bets are off. They will see that they can beat me, and they'll have been right about that. And indeed, he was correct. So ultimately, Roosevelt, as we all know, lost the court packing bill. Um, I want to leave time for some Q&A, so I, I won't get into this. But one of the things that I found compelling and that I really wanted to, to uh, bring to this book was, if, was the fact that while Roosevelt suffered one setback after another, really from the very first moment, as I said, when the plan began with the black eye, it's still very possible, almost to the very end, that he's going to get what he wants. Despite all of this, the power of Roosevelt's personality, his persuasiveness, and the dynamics in the Congress made this very touch and go right to the very end. It seems, in retrospect, clear, as history so often does, that the writing was on the wall from the first moment. But in fact, through the very last days of this fight, if Roosevelt had been willing to compromise, he in an instant could have gotten four justices rather than six, and we would have a Supreme Court of 13 today. He refused to compromise. He did not want to be seen as backing down against the Democratic Senate, and he lost as a result. But in conclusion, I would say that in Roosevelt's view, he lost the battle, as he often said, but he won the war. The court had switched and it switched in an enduring way. Because even though Roberts went back generally to the right, Van Devanter had retired and Roosevelt was able to appoint a successor, Hugo Black, who became one of the great liberals on the court, as Roosevelt knew that he would. And so this constitutional revolution that begins in 1937 becomes an enduring change and really something that lasts for many decades and has only just in recent decades begun to be eroded in any significant way by a conservative court. So Roosevelt did win the war, but it was a very costly victory. And it was, as Alan Brinkley has written, the end of reform. That book of Alan Brinkley's that some of you may have written, a terrific book uh, about uh, the, the essentially the end of the New Deal, 
that account begins with the court packing fight. And so many of these fissures that had existed in the Democratic Party for decades between the liberals in the party and the Southern conservatives in the party were just driven wide open by the court plan in Roosevelt's uh, first, first weeks in office in his second term. And so it became, in many ways, the end of reform and also the beginning of the modern Republican Party. Because these Southern conservatives who aligned themselves with the Republicans stayed essentially with the Republicans. And over succeeding decades, as we know, they became Republicans. And they left over the course of the 1940s and the 1950s and then in a final great wave after Lyndon Johnson's Civil Rights Act of 1964. So, the argument, as I said earlier, is an enduring one. It's, it's never really over, and we've begun to engage it again in earnest here uh, during the Obama era. Uh, and we see a similar clash between a progressive president, one with, for the time being at least, significant majorities in both houses of Congress and the support of most of the public, or close to, and a determined conservative minority on the court and in the country and at the grassroots. So Roosevelt in 1937 may have said that we won the war, but he knew and he said that each successive generation would ultimately have to wage that war for itself. He thought that standing on the foundation that he built, the future generations would be able to wage that war successfully. But that, of course, remains to be seen. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. The question was uh, about the compromise that Roosevelt uh, refused to make. And um, this is uh, one of the things that um, has led historians to sort of beat up on Roosevelt perpetually that, you know, he, he, he should have seen that he should have grabbed the compromise that he could get. But um, there are a couple reasons that he didn't compromise. And one was really that he didn't like to, to compromise in the middle of a fight. He would often compromise as a bill was being shaped. Uh, he'd give away a whole lot in the course of trying to get a bill done. But he had staked out a very aggressive position on this. And he really felt that he would lose face in a significant way. He would lose, as he put it, the whip hand. He really felt that he controlled this Congress and that any concession made publicly um, would really create all kinds of trouble for him. And if he just pressed on, the longer he fought, the more the public would tire of, of, of his opponent's argument and the more they would rally to his side. He really believed in, in the power of his own persuasiveness because he had been so successful uh, in, in, in such a profound way in, in his first term. So he really believed that in the end he wouldn't have to compromise. But there was another compromise that was being floated, not just a four-judge compromise, but there was another which was a two-judge compromise, which also would have been a snap. But the problem for Roosevelt with the two-judge compromise was that everybody in Washington knew, and not just Washington knew, that he had pretty openly promised the next Supreme Court seat to the Senate Majority Leader, uh, an old Arkansan bull of a man named Joe Robinson, who was another one of these Southern conservatives in the Democratic Party. And even though it was, Ro it was Robinson more than anybody in the Senate who carried the New Deal through on his back, nobody believed for a second, least of all Roosevelt, that he really supported the New Deal. And so Roosevelt sort of loosely made this promise as kind of a quid pro quo for Robinson in the early days of, of, of the first term and regretted it, um, never more so than in the middle of this court fight. And so Roosevelt knew that if he got two justices out of this fight and we had a court of 11, one would be Robinson and the other would be somebody like Hugo Black and they would cancel each other out. So no net gain at all. So he had put himself in a little bit of a hole. He needed more justices not just to buffer the conservatives who were on the court at the time, but the conservative that he would have to add. Now, how did he get out of appointing Robinson? Why did he appoint Hugo Black? This is one of the great dramatic moments, I think, in the story. And that is that in July 1937, uh, when the bill finally comes up for debate on the Senate floor, after months of arguing about it in committee and having hearings and so forth, Robinson is in this awkward position of trying to push through this court packing bill that he doesn't believe in to support the New Deal that he doesn't believe in to finally fulfill his life's dream of getting a Supreme, Supreme Court seat. So he throws himself bodily into this fight, stands in the well of the Senate, shouting, bellowing at his, at his opponents, banging his fist on the mahogany desk, 
And in the middle of this, he collapses on the floor in the Senate. He turns purple and is, is carried out to get some, some fresh air. And uh, his fellow Democrats send him home to the Methodist building, which is just right across the street from here and right across the street from the Supreme Court. And they say, get some rest. And, uh, and the following morning, he, he is found dead on the floor of his apartment. Um, and with Robinson dies any hope that the bill is going to get passed. That's the end for the court packing bill. And this horrible irony uh, for Roosevelt um, has sort of reached its climax. And now, ironically, again, he's free to finally appoint a liberal to the court. And he announces his selection not long after if you go black. Sir. In, in your biography, with uh, that brief, brief biography you just read, I noticed that you, you were not uh, an opponent of framing. Did you find that to be uh, an impediment or any difficulty in doing your research as you were going through not just the manuscript revision, but I guess one deck up the, at the law library here as well? It, it, it was a challenge. I mean, I, I got into this initially because, uh, as I mentioned, I was, uh, I'm a presidential or political historian by training, and I got into this because I had questions I wanted to answer fundamentally about Roosevelt. And I came to feel that I couldn't answer those questions without really understanding what was going on in the court. Um, I had taken a terrific course as an undergraduate on the politics of the legal system, and uh, it got me very interested in these issues, and I had continued uh, over the time since to read up on them, but I, I'm, I'm, I was not and I am not a constitutional scholar. But I always remember the words of this terrific professor who taught that course who said, the law, and this is with all due respect to anybody here who may be a lawyer, he said, the law is too important to be left to the lawyers. And really, we all have an obligation as citizens to understand these constitutional questions, not all of which are so complex that you must have years of, of legal training to understand them. And so uh, I, um, I, I came to understand them to my satisfaction. I, I wanted to write a book that would, uh, w would be seen as, as intellectually sound by not just lawyers but constitutional scholars. And uh, I had a couple of them read my manuscript to make sure that I was on solid ground. But I also knew I was writing a book for people like me who knew something about these issues, who cared something about these issues, but you know, weren't steeped um, in, uh, in constitutional scholarship. So it, it, it was a challenge, but it was one that ultimately I was very eager to take on, because I feel like everybody ought to understand more about this constitution of ours. Sir. In your last comments about the enduring results of, of, of this episode, you mentioned the Southern Democrats joining the, the Republicans for, for a coalition. Do you also agree that the result was that the Republicans gave up the fight to reverse the New Deal and embrace the New Deal uh, from then until Newt Gingrich? <laughs> well, I, I think uh, there is something to be said for that. What they, they weren't really looking, um, even in the late 1930s, to reverse the New Deal, to repeal the New Deal. We were hearing now these calls that the Health Care Act should be repealed and so forth. Um, particularly once the court flipped and became liberal, uh, there was a tacit acceptance, really, of much of the New Deal by Republicans. And what they were looking to do, the battle shifted a little bit. They were looking to prevent Roosevelt from passing anything else, which they did pretty successfully. The big wages and hours bill that he tried to pass, a big executive reorganization bill in, in, in 1937, 1938. Um, so they were looking to stop his forward progress, and they were looking to balance the budget and to devolve more power back to the states and so forth. And so um, many of the terms of the debate that continue through Gingrich and continue to this day uh, were pretty well established at this time. One of these conservative Democrats, Josiah Bailey of North Carolina, sat down and wrote what he called a conservative manifesto. Uh, and got a number of Democrats to, to sign on to this in the late 1930s. And it called for smaller government, balanced budget, lower taxes, all this sort of stuff. Um, and it really is one of the founding documents of modern conservatism. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that the, the argument against the New Deal never really ended, but there was no active movement for repeal. I think it really is only with Gingrich um, that you have people in power rather than somebody like Barry Goldwater running for president and not, not winning. You had people in 
you know, positions of very active power dedicated to allowing, in Gingrich's words, Medicare to die on the vine, to wither and die on the vine. Not a New Deal program, Great Society program, obviously, but same idea. And Social Security. Yeah, and Social Security, right. Um, thank you. Yes, sir. It's becoming like an A meeting. We're in, I'm not a. <laughs> right. Um, was there no one in the White House at that time uh, when this thing came to fruition? I mean, they had a lot of very bright people in the Patriot Deal who were very attuned to the Congress and the, the constellation of forces there. I mean, you know, the conservative coalition was in the South was well known to everybody at the time. Was there nobody at the time when you had that option for those? Well, I, I'll break that into two pieces. I think the general feeling, both in the White House and the administration and in the country, and even in the Congress, was that Roosevelt was going to get to do pretty well whatever he pleased in his second term. He had won in such spectacular terms in November 1936, and there were so many in Congress who were so indebted to him, who had come in on his coattails, and his, po and his popularity was, was so remarkably high that he really felt essentially that he had a blank check to do whatever it was that he needed to do, not just to continue the progress of the, of the first term, but to build on it in significant ways. And there was nobody really around him saying, you got to cool down your ambition. That position of Roosevelt's was not that unreasonable. If he had begun with a number of other things, he would have gotten them done. The mistake he made was beginning with, with, with court packing, and that imperiled and ultimately limited the, the success of everything else. I think the, the, the issue, and, and, and we don't have time to fully get into this here, but the, the problem with the court packing plan is that he didn't seek the advice of the smart people around him. He had been having an open conversation for years about what to do about the court. But ultimately, when he made the significant decision not to consider an amendment and to move toward court packing, he basically shut everybody except for his attorney general, who was very much an enabler in all this, shut them out of the discussion. And they developed this plan very much in secret. They didn't talk, discuss it with the Congress. They were eager to surprise Congress with this. They thought the element of surprise was very significant here and would be a lot of fun, which is the way Roosevelt thought about these things sometimes. And so it was not well discussed with his uh, supporters on the Hill, and it was not well discussed with his advisors. He let them in on this the morning of. There were a few who knew about it in the last week or, or so before it was unveiled, but he mostly brought them in to help edit the presidential message that he was going to deliver to Congress. They were not there to question what he was doing, and they saw that. And so then, the morning of February 5th, Roosevelt calls in his cabinet, reveals to his cabinet what he's going to do. They're shocked and horrified. Then he brings in the, the power brokers in, on, in Congress, brings them into the White House, tells them, and then says, I have to be excused. I have a press conference in the Oval Office, and went and revealed the, the plan to, to the nation. And uh, the, the reaction, as I said, was instantaneous. And um, one of uh, these congressional leaders, one of these Democrats, got in his car to go back from the White House to Capitol Hill and turned to the others and said, boys, here's where I cash in my chits. He was done. And Vice President John Nance Garner, who is um, a minor but I think very compelling character in this, in this book, um, Garner goes back with them to Capitol Hill. Uh, and uh, when he stands in the well of the Senate as the plan is being read aloud um, to the senators, and this is the first they're hearing of it, Garner stands and holds his nose and gestures thumbs down. <laughs> so it's an incitement. And then when the fight really heats up in the summer, Garner announces that he's already left for a fishing trip. And he's gone. And he refuses to use his uh, leverage on Capitol Hill to help the president, which was really the final break between the two of them. So a subplot, but a significant one. Well, I'm afraid that uh, we need to uh, thank Jeff Sheffield. <laughs> It was a wonderful presentation and I think an education for all of us about this, not only this period of the history, history, but what's happening now. And I think it really was 
met all of our expectations, thank Jeff. You. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. Jeff, it will sit here. We have books for sale, and uh, we'll try to move through a book signing in a reasonably good order, if you don't mind, so we can be out of the room by 1.30. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.